Hi there and welcome back my friends to Torment, Tides of Numenera. We're here in the interior of the Heart of the Bloom. We'll see what we can do. There's this Abikos who is trying to... What is he trying to do? He's doing something with that Wayne. Is he the infection? Ahead you see a mass of bloom tongues, bigger than any you have encountered thus far. They wave gently as if beckoning you forward. Your companions hesitate, looking to you. <coughs> Let's see what, what you say. I'm usually one for experimentation, but this... She looks at you, her face ashen. There's no telling what it will demand of you, child. Look at me and tell me, if you'd want this fate, yours could be well worse. She turns again to, the f to face the wriggling mass. Know what you're willing to sacrifice, that is my advice to you. And thoughts, how many of my sisters would I give for myself? I dare not even think that way. Oh, what's wrong? As soon as you ask quest the question, you already know the answer from the part of Oom in your head. It is afraid. Hi, Bear. You're asking me? I didn't want to come here in the first place. He wipes his forehead, his easy smile gun. Be smart, lass. You know what you came for. Don't accept any less and don't give any more than what it's worth. That's... that's all I got. I thought I should have stayed in Sagus. Nothing's worth this risk. Stay here, I'm going in. Most curious. And we have the... we have the scalpel with us. Let's hope that helps. <laughs> ah! Before you loom the twisted mass of tubes, arteries, roots and tongues, heaving and pulsing in the murky light. Flesh glimmers with foul shades of purple and black, pocked with pustules and necrosis. Bloom whispers gather, swarming around you like fat buzzing flies. They sound distracted, confused. As you step closer, bloom tongues surround you, drawing you into a wet, nauseating embrace. Though they seem solid and corporeal, they somehow pass through your flesh, thrusting into your head, your limbs and your guts, igniting prickly hot cold sensations all over your body. The multitude of bloom voices chitter and babble, clearly alarmed by your intrusion, but unable to muster an attack upon your mind. For the moment the feeding of the abicos has made them tired and weak. We could stab the heart with a transdimensional scalpel. <laughs> <laughs> but we're here for Ishan. Isha Ishan. Where is he? The bloom doesn't seem to understand, or if it does, it ignores your words. A few random disconnected images flash through your mind, seemingly spawned by the chittering voices, but none of them contain a human scholar. Ah, uh, we'll form an image of Ishan in our, in our mind. You focus on the goal that brought you here, the abducted scholar Ishan. Even as you think of him, an image begins to form in your head. A bald head, a beard, strange markings on the body, as if you somehow know this man. Or perhaps your sire did. The Bloom's voices go quiet. They recognize Ishan too. And now they know why you're here and who sent you. Whispers turn into a cacophony of buzzes and shrieks and they flood into your mind, scattering your thoughts, erring deep into your hidden memories. Moments from the changing god's past flash across your mind's eye. Too quick to comprehend, finally a memory surfaces. Stand with a woman upon a circle of gold, the sky clear and blue above you. Mia la West. The woman is well known to you, the same woman who helped you choose this spot years before, the same woman who built this enclave with you together. Or we'll come back to, to the beginning of the game even. Her face has changed, ravaged by time. The flesh is rotting away, exposing the glistening muscles beneath. He turns away from you, as if to hide her ugliness. Not even your handiwork is proof against time. No, Marallel, you say, I have no way of fixing you, but you need not live in shame. You present her with a mask, its expression enigmatic, decorated with intricate patterns of gold. A pretty thing, she says, unable to hide the bitterness in her voice. I can just as well wrap my face in bandages or cover my head with a sack. Put it on, your voice is insistent. There's something more to the mask. He hears it in your voice, and she raises your gift to her face. As she does, the memory ends, cut off abruptly by a chorus of shrieks from the bloom. They chitter at you, their purpose as enigmatic as Marilel's mask. Why did you want that memory? 
very inquisitive. The voices softly hiss and groan, all of them together. Briefly an image of Marilyn, the first cast off, appears in your mind's eye, raising the mask to her face. Now show me the rest of the memory. The bloom voices chitter and click, sounding close, gathered around you like a pack of beasts. You sense hunger from them. If you want to see the rest of your memory, you will have to feed them other memories, recollections that bear something in common with the one you just witnessed. Oh, um, I'll try to feed false memories of Marilyn to the Bloom. You summon the tidal energies within you, shaping them into imagined interactions between your sire and Marilyn, letting them play out in your mind's eye. It's easy enough to incorporate elements of what you know about the changing god in the first cast off, mixing them together with stories you've heard from others. Fortunately, your mastery of the tides is near absolute and the bloom voices can't resist the illusory feast you place before them. They devour the memories as quickly as you can conceive them, gorging themselves on falsehoods and lies. You recognize the man at once. It's Mazov, the cast of artificer you met in Syrian Daywalker's Mere. Your first thought is that the bloom has somehow released the wrong man, but no, the memorivera deceived you. Ishan is Mazov. For the moment Mazov is recovering from his ordeal, barely aware of his surroundings, he hasn't even seen you that. <clears throat> I'll try to reassure Mazov, or we disengage from the bloom tongues. <sighs> I'll try to reassure Mazov. We're here for him. You try to call out Mazov, but you can't find the words. Fragments of memories drift in and out of your consciousness as the bloom digests them. The unfinished memory of Mia Lavest bubbles to the surface, playing out in your mind's eye. You're facing Marilyn, the first cast off as she holds the mask you gave her. Put it on, you hear yourself say, and she places the mask over her face. At once it melds with her flesh and her face becomes that of a lovely young woman. Eyes wide, knowing that something has changed, and you hold up a looking glass for her to see. She laughs aloud, a sound you haven't heard from her in years. You can change your face at will, you say to her. Try it. Marilyn nods, watching the looking glass carefully as her face morphs to that of an old woman, then a homely beggar lady, and a Magellan, and a dozen more. The last face you see is dark haired, regal in bearing. It's the face of the Memovira. Accompanied by a distant sense of hunger from the bloom, the memory fades. The implication is clear. The Memovira is merely a disguise, a mask that conceals the first cast off. She has been alive, hiding behind a false identity for years. Even as you contemplate this revelation, the bloom tongues slide painlessly out of your body, setting you free. They show no further interest in you, and the whispering voices are gone from your mind. Mazov rises, clutching himself, and he abruptly vomits a clot of black fluid onto the glistening flesh beneath his feet. Small red wounds mar the flesh between the wires crisscrossing skin. Gods! He growls. Gods! He looks up at you, his mechanical eye sockets spin, wheels within wheels, focusing on your face. You're the cast off that was riding Syrian Daywalker. The hell are you doing down here? <clears throat> How did you recognize me? Muscle movements, he says, grimacing, small variations on expression, as good as a signature for those who know what to look for. He has more of the black fluid against the back of his wrist. You didn't answer me. What are you doing down there? here? <coughs> I thought I was rescuing someone named Ishan, but here you are instead. Yeah, that's me, he says. It's a nickname. Short for Ishanizar, because I look like one. Whatever it is, but no one calls me that except he pauses and smirks. The first sent you, didn't she? Not surprised. You won't be getting the resonance chamber working on her own. It's all too easy to destroy the damn thing if you don't know what you're doing. Young thing about the words said in his voice stirs a memory in you. Resonance chamber. Resonance chamber the sensation builds. Mazov winces, teeth clenched. Gods, the bloom is a terrible host. Stuck its damn tongues into my guts to force feed me, filled my lungs with bile. Not sure what you did to get me out, but thank you. He spits a black tinged wet of phlegm over his shoulder. Well, how do we get out of here? She's waiting, and you know who she is. Oh. 
Hold on, how did you end up a prisoner to begin with? The Bloom took me, he says with a careless shrug. Not a surprise, it's not happy with the first. You probably already know that, so it took me, because it knows I'm important to her. He says this casually, and without the faintest hint of pride. Anyway, I should get back to the first, she's going to be... He waves the hand, well, you know. I don't know, actually, I thought I was working for the Memovira until just a few minutes ago. Mazov's expression goes wooden. Skist, he says, rubbing his forehead. Look, don't tell her I said anything. I don't need anyone shouting at me right now, let alone her. It's the worst headache I've ever had. The headache is uncoiling through your head now as well. Alarm spreads over Mazov's face, and he reaches out to catch you as you topple forward. You're underwater. The fading pulse of a sonar alarm ripples through the water, then it is gone. An invisible pressure crushes, crushes your body, squeezing your head. A gibra with a cast of tattoo rises from the dark to confront you. I should have known. You need something of ours to finish your resonance chamber, don't you, father? He regards you with scorn. You haven't learned anything. You would sacrifice all of us for the chance at survival. You and the first. Pride, pride blinds you both. You're wrong, Thom. You snarl. Yet his words frighten you. Is he saying Marilyn's alive? Their own plan to stop the sorrow? It must be stopped. Any plan of hers would be dangerous. I've built the resonance chamber to save us all, you say. It has the power to weaken the sorrow. It can kill the creature. A half-truth. The chamber certainly has the power, but who knows if it would be enough to kill. Will you apologize to me then, selfish child? Will you beg my forgiveness? I'm ready to learn something new. You lie. You always have, Thom says calmly. Although your motives differ, Morel's plan and yours will result in the same end, the destruction of every last cast-off. I will not allow this to happen. He makes a complicated gesture with his fingers and the pressure on your head increases. Thom's voice grows muffled and fades as your mind, Sire's consciousness, flees his imprisoned body, abandoning it to the gibra in favor of a new host. You return to consciousness, a headache fading, your mouth tastes of seawater or blood. Light and wet heat bashes the side, bath, baths the side of your face as the bloom opens a trans-dimensional portal. You can't be sure where it leads, but it's certainly your only way out. Someone, Mazov, is bracing you, holding you up. You're right. Mazov, what is the first plan for the chamber? To severe the... He gives you an odd look. You know, maybe you should ask her. I don't know enough about what's going on here, just know that it will free us from the sorrow without sucking us all into someone else's mind. That should be enough, he shrugs. She can't do it without me, though. I'd best be getting back. Patting you awkwardly on the shoulder, he limps past you into the portal and vanishes. It's only when he's gone that you see the glittering contours of a small object lying where Mazov was standing. A mere caster, it must have fallen from Mazov's pockets. You wipe the slime from the joints of the machine and add it to your belongings. The frictionless meercaster. This spherical object is made of an unfamiliar gold-greenish metal. The object seems to be constantly moving, rotating in different directions, but when you hold it, you cannot feel the slightest hint of friction. You feel the click and whirl of countless mechanisms moving within the device, generating an almost intolerable heat. I'll remember that. Wow. And now, let's see what we get here. Whoa. What does the Katina intelligence do? Plus one in intellect tasks. Wow, nice. Um, Maelstrom would be good, right? Let's see what we can do. Stat pools or edge? Hmm. We have a lot in stat pools. Let's increase the edge of our intellect once again, maybe. Speed was also important, though. We've never run low on intellect, but speed, edge provides a bonus to all tasks and challenges that use a particular stat. Use other people for speed. Mm, yeah, let's, let's, let's go for speed this time. So, what can we do? I mean, the obvious thing is the Meercaster. Let's dive into that thing. See what it does. Intolerable heat. You. 
Mika says, hot to the touch. You feel the click and whirl of countless mechanisms moving beneath your hands. The urge to explore the mere within is as palpable as thirst. But we'll inspect it first. The clicking of the mechanisms within the device is a rhythmic, rhythmic, rhythmic thing like a drumbeat. Like soldiers marching in perfect, helpless unison into the mirror. As your consciousness coalesces, you find yourself in an underground bunker. It is shaking from an attack far above. You stand mid salute in front of a cast off encased in an articulated metal corpus. He's so skeletal you doubt he could move without it. You remember his name is Lovak, Pilot reckons second in command in the endless battle. Three advisors sit behind him. Lovak shakes his synth encased head and addresses you. Don't worry about the message, Barry Kyle. It's been rendered moot. We're just lucky Commander Reckon made it out of Miela Vista alive. She missed the destruction of the Sanctuary by moments. Thunder's explosion rocks the bunker, sending everyone staggering. As you can see, we have troubles of our own. Lovak says, getting back to his feet, the Changing God's latest ploy has paralyzed the Reconciler of Truth. Of course, Heaven's Rejoinder remains functioning, which means we cannot reverse their successes while they can reverse ours. He leads you to the strategy table, showing a three-dimensional projection of a battlefield across parallel realities. He swipes through several images. All of them show your army on the verge of defeat. He shakes his head. We're in more danger now of losing this war than since the first died. I'm afraid I must send you out again, Barry Kyle. We must save the Reconciler. What are the Reconciler of Truth and Heaven's Rejoinder? Again, eh? I suppose one of the hazards of dancing so often through realities and times is that it plays hell with memory. Not to worry, I'll explain it once more. Centuries ago, when the first still lived, she found the Reconciler, a message of the ancients which allowed the user to look at multiple versions of a recent event and lock reality onto the one they liked best, making it the only reality. With it, she began choosing realities in which we had won more battles than we had lost and quickly drove the changing god to the brink of defeat. Until that is, he acquired his own machine, Heaven's Rejoinder, which can undo the Reconciler's realities and make its own. Since then, our war has become one of faint and counterfeint, of competing and collapsing realities, where no battle is ever entirely won or completely lost, and where both sides look always for a final advantage. He sighs and looks at the table, where one by one the multiple battlefields are beginning to wink out, narrowing down to one. And it seems as if the Chalcodon, the Changing God's general, may have found his advantage at last. With the Reconciler sabotaged and Heaven's rejoinder well defended, we may never turn the tide. And how did the massacre at Mila West happen? How did the shields come down? I do not know. Maybe the sorrow finally grew strong enough to smash through. Maybe there was a traitor. I have heard nothing. Um. What do we go for? Um, I think we are ready to serve. Excellent. The Slovak and turns to his advisors, all castoffs you notice. Friends, what are your suggestions? How do we undo what has been done to the Reconciler without using the Reconciler? It's called female castoff in red armor speaks up. I recommend an all-out assault on the position of Heaven's Rejoinder. This will, of course, fail, but it will give cover for Bericoil to slip through the paths of the White Nests and reach the Rejoinder from behind. There she can reset it, then destroy it. She pounds the table. Then we will be the only side who can change history. A male mutant, exquisitely beautiful except for the second mouth in his throat, speaks in melodious harmony. I suggest Bericoil use the reality storm that ravages no man's land to find the Reconciler's saboteur. If she can navigate the shifting shards, she can stop the saboteur before he reaches it. He shrugs. This will only return us to the status quo, of course, but it will be easier for Bericoil to deal with one man than well, the deadly white nests. Any other suggestions? asks Slovak. There's no answer, he turns to you. I approve of either path, as it is you who will face these challenges. I leave it to you which you will choose. What do you say? And we'll decide in the next episode, my friends. Thank you for watching and happy gaming to you. This is Immanuel Khan signing out. See you soon and happy gaming.